and welcome to the third annual TED Ed event. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm so proud of these five people right here. They have spent a majority of the year coming up with ideas, attending meetings, writing their talks, brainstorming, meeting with us multiple times, probably more times than they wanted to. Um, and this is the testament to the amount of work that they've put in all year. Um, so please enjoy. I'm Brian Ross, and I'm the vice chair of the TED Club. And I also should have mentioned that I am the chair of the TED Club, and my name is Maya Robles. And last year I gave a talk, and it is. A, very exciting thing to be in the position the position that these five are about to be in but it's also very intimidating and very impressive that they're able to put together these talks and deliver them to you today so can we just get a preliminary round of applause for All right, so our first uh, person up is ninth grader Caroline Spengler Sakata, and she's here to share her talk about heroes. Talk today is about heroes. Do you really need that red cape? So the other day I was in HEB and I saw something that caught my eye. I saw an older woman was in one of those electric carts and she was staring up longingly at a jar of tomato sauce. Obviously, she was unable to reach it. Then a younger man came along and grabbed that jar for her and handed it to her. A smile spread across her face. To that man, his action may have seemed insignificant, meaningless, small. But to that woman, that man's action meant to the world. To that woman, that man was a hero. So what's the definition of a hero? Some people say a hero is someone who sacrifices everything for one cause. Others say a hero is someone who changes the world for the better. But technically defined, a hero is someone who is admired for their courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. That woman in the grocery store admired that man for his noble qualities. He was the only one that helped her, and he took that extra step to help her. A hero is someone who takes that extra step, that extra leap, to help someone else. A hero is not afraid of the consequences that their actions may bring, because he or she knows that what they're doing is the right thing. A hero may not be aware that he or she is a hero, but to the people they are affecting, they may have a great impact. So when I say the word hero, what do you think of? Do you think of this guy Superman? Do you think of someone with big muscles, the ability to fly? Or do you think about that man in the grocery store? There are many different types of heroes in this world. Some people go into houses to save children and grab them that are burning down. Other people jump in front of trains and push people out of the way so they won't get hit. Others simply just help someone else down the stairs. Or others do tiny, consistent, actions that may seem insignificant, but have a great impact on the rest of the world. We get so caught up in the idea of what a perfect hero is from the media. We think this is a hero. We think, oh, I can never do extraordinary actions like this. We see on TV these people who do these grand actions go, I can never do like that, be like that. So we cancel out any idea of us becoming a hero. Well, think about it this way. If we do one, just one, extraordinary action in our life that we are praised for tremendously, but spend the rest of our life being toxic to the people around us, how much of a hero are we really? As opposed to someone who does tiny, insignificant to them actions consistently throughout their lives and impacts many people, they might be a greater hero. Oh, sorry. Um, we can do simple actions, and those are the greatest actions that can be heroic. Simple actions, such as the story I'm about to share with you. So I was at the airport the other day, and I was coming back from spring break when I saw something that caught my eye. There was a young girl standing at the top of an escalator, and she seemed petrified. She was too afraid to go on it. And then I spotted her mom was on the escalator, and she was going down the escalator. When she noticed that her daughter was still at the top of the escalator and was not in rooms refusing to go on, she tried going up and down the escalator. Well, if you've ever been on an escalator, you know that's not exactly how they work. When another person came along, it was a teenage girl, and she put out her hand, and the little girl grabbed the girl's hand and they walked down the escalator together. Once they got to the bottom, the girl gave the daughter to her mom and walked away. The girl probably never thought about that incident again in her life. It probably was very insignificant to her. But if you put yourself in the mom and the daughter's shoes, it's a very different story. The mom 
couldn't get to her daughter. Her daughter was alone and vulnerable at the top of the es escalator. And that's pretty scary as a parent. And the daughter was facing this big metal machine that would take control of her, and she was too afraid to get on it. But then a girl comes along and helps her, reunites the mother with the daughter, and helps the daughter overcome her fear. Now, that teenage girl probably will never be on the news, never be in the media, will never be praised tremendously for her act. But small, consistent acts like that may have a greater impact than one huge, extraordinary act. Every single person in this room can become a hero. When I was younger, I thought you need, to, you need to have the big muscles and the superpower and ability to fly. But that's not what truly being a hero is about. We need to be courageous and seize the opportunities that are in front of us to help another person. We need to see the opportunity and say, hey, that may be insignificant, but may have a greater impact on someone else's life. When we see someone who's struggling to pay for their lunch in front of them, help them. We see someone and we can help their groceries, take their groceries from inside the store to into their car. Or we could simply just help open a door for someone or help them down the stairs. It's simple actions like these that are done consistently that help us become a hero. We need to erase the idea of what a hero is that we see from the media or on TV so we can seize the opportunities in front of us. So next time you make an interaction with someone today, be kind and be helpful because you might be making a huge impact on their life or become their next hero. And if you do these actions consistently throughout your life, you'll become a true hero. Thank you. This is Danielle Pham sharing a more personal story. I'll tell you a story about this girl I know. She's a typical Asian you see at school who, who is obsessed with her grade. However, if she comes, if you, however, if you come to ask her if she's, if she ever finds happiness in her straight A's report card, she wouldn't know the answer to that question. She was once an enthusiastic and confident girl who sees joy in her education and she sees hope in the darkest time. However, as times go by. She started to lose the colors that she once has on the world. She, all she can see is black and white. She forgets that life was never, was never about the grades. Life was never about um, the passing or failing, but it's all about the memories that she makes along the way and the lesson that she learned. Now you may wonder, what happened to that little girl? What happened to that fearless, confident, and passionate girl? What, where did she go? She became older. As she, as she grew older, she became aware of the um, expectations that her families and the world have on her. She can't see them, she can't hear them, but she, she can feel them deep down inside her. Waking up each day, she feels the um, pressures and she feels suffocated from the pressure that started eating upon her. She, um, she knew that she wasn't born for the system, but the world doesn't have an exit for her to escape this reality. The, the pressure from the world, the pressure from the world, from her family and from society, has transformed that one fearless, confident girl into a girl that's intimidated of everything. She now is afraid of making mistakes because she knows that everything can cost her a grade. And she, um, and she, and she lost all the colors that she once has. She misses out the joy and experience that a young teenager should have. But then she realized one day that that's not the importance in life. And she's working every day to regain the colors that she once lost. I am that girl who lost her colors once and is working every day to see the colorful girls world once again. Now many people believe that by scoring a four point GPA or getting, a, um, getting to an Ivy League school will guarantee a lifetime success. However, there's no equation mathematical equation that proved the same. Quoting from a professor at Wharton, a, um, academic, success, a lot of academic excellence does not guarantee a lifetime success, um, a career excellence. The grades you have measures one's, ab one's ability or their talents, but instead it's measured, his, it's measured their ability to, uh, conform to, the, to conform to the system and Therefore, it's not a grade measured. Grade um, only measures one. Um, grades fail to measure. What grades fail to measure is one: creativity, leadership, and social skills. These are skills that we often under, uh, underestimate in our society, but are essential traits to our, to one's success. We speak of change, of uniqueness, of progress, but with our current system today. We are failing people for being different. 
Steve Jobs finished his high school with a GPA of 2.65, while J.K. Rowling graduated high, um, her college with a C average. Even Einstein was a victim of the system. These are only a few people who have successfully defeated the system to be known. What about the others who are out there who have the potential to change the world but did not survive the conformity of the system? Especially in this day and age where the young adults have more potential than that they have ever been. With the help of social, with the help of the internet and the technologies, they are able to explore more knowledge that school would ever teach them. A school system of the 1900s does not meet the needs and the standard of the younger generation today. With the impact of technology on our life, especially teens, the school requires the school system to change and to adapt to the new evolving generations. Now I may speak of the future and the past and of my story, but none of that is as, as important as the pain that current students are enduring because of mental illness. There were countless of times where that young girl sat in her room doubting her abilities and questioning her worth because of a letter she see that she, is, she received earlier from school. Mental illness is taking an impact on um, students as they have never been before. According to, national, um, according to the National Alliance on Mental Health, one in five students show symptoms of depressions and mental illness. And 50% of all mental illness cases begins at age of 14. Parents in school system should start putting the students and teenage well-being as a priority, not the grades, not the achievement, not like the, pros the prosperity and the future that they could make. And parents usually are concerned of when the children during a child get a C with a letter C in math or in science. But what parents are, should be more alarmed is their child's uh, morals and ethics value. Research shows that due to the competitive of the system, students feel that they are obligated to score good grades, regardless of what method they use. What has our education system become when students are willingly to put the morality on the line for a letter A? Is it worth it? Is this the world that we want our younger generation to grow up in? Paul Feyerbach once said, teach, um, once said that teachers using grades and a fear of failure mold the brains of the young until they have lost every ounce of imagination they might have once possessed. It is time that our society needs to change our education system because only with this change we can move forward to the future. We can, it is, Every generation has their own needs and own values. It is not valid to apply the values of the older generations on the younger ones. And it's a, it is also the time that the older gener generation step down and start listening to the younger ones because in their end, the world is left under their hands. Don't let another child become a girl who lost her job color. Thank you. Here's Elena Khan who will be telling us about how to truly be happy. to go ahead and start my talk off with a simple question. How many of you all have or at least know someone who has some sort of social media platform? Okay, perfect. So I'm sure you all are pretty familiar then with social media. Social media is great. It's a way for us to interact with one another via Instagram posts, Snapchats, and even tweets. It's a way for us to communicate with people who we may not see on a daily basis, meet new friends, and show what our interests are to people all around the world. I personally am an avid user of social media. It brings me joy to talk to my cousins who live across the world, make new friends, and ultimately see what my family and friends are up to. But with the many advantages that I've just listed, there are also many disadvantages that we have to take into account that can affect our own happiness. For example, in the society we live in, we are constantly told that we are not pretty enough skinny enough or good enough. And the issue with this is it causes us to experience unhappiness, whether you like it or not. For example, many of these posts that you can see up here are just showing proof that we are all so worried about how we look and our image online. For example, many times people will post pictures that they have edited on apps like Facetune or they will post uh, pictures with filters like Valencia Pro, or they will add 
dog ears for their pictures, to hide their uniqueness that they just despise. But the truth is, it shows people that we all can never be happy with the way we truly look. So we have to edit ourselves to make ourselves feel more happier or even more confident. The third thing I wanted to point out about social media is that we all tend to compare ourselves to people that we see online. But the reality is you actually don't know the behind the scenes of every post, tweet, or snap. Because you probably didn't know that the girl who was just smiling in her latest Instagram post was actually crying three hours before she posted it because she didn't like the way she looked. The message that we should be spreading is that we are all enough. And you don't have to conform yourself to society. You don't have to compare yourself to one another. Because we can all enjoy social media for what it truly is. A way for us to show what our interests are and to bring us all together as one. Not tear us apart little by little. The second thing I wanted to talk about was friends and kind of like the feeling of being left out. Throughout the past few years, I always struggled with trying to find my own happiness and it ultimately had to do with the people who I was surrounding myself with. I would always put a brave smile and act like I wasn't struggling, but I actually was struggling quite a bit. For example, I surrounded myself with people who did not clap for me when I achieved something that was really special to me. People who did not appreciate my values, or people who simply just did not like what I had to offer in the friendship. And I would disparage myself, think that I wasn't worthy enough to have those friends, and ultimately thought that I was a problem. But the truth is, that's simply not true. Because I never realized that I'm worth so much more than people who just cannot see that. And that's what I wanted to tell you all. You are all worth so much more, so you should never allow people to affect your own happiness. Because you should never allow someone with the significance of a speed bump represent a roadblock in your life. The third thing I wanted to point out was that when I thought that I was losing all the people who were very close to my heart, I thought that I had no one. But the truth is, you all have yourself. And no matter how cliche or that may sound, you will always have yourself. So love it, cherish it, don't nitpick everything about yourself. One thing that helped me kind of find my own happiness was to journal. Journaling is a great way for you to de-stress yourself and just to write and express your raw emotions. Another great alternative was the happiness challenge, a challenge designed for you to do activities to keep yourself busy. So basically what I'm trying to say is that do what makes you happy, whether it's baking, playing sports, or spending time with your loved ones. Because happiness was never about comparing yourself to one another, figuring out what you saw online, or how many friends you had. It was always about you being kinder to yourself, having a few genuine close friends, or um, happiness was always about you embracing the person you were becoming because no one is you, and that is your power. And lastly, I just wanted to share with you a glimpse of what makes me happy. And as you can see, majority, if you know me, majority of the slide is my family, because my family has always been there for me. And I wanted you guys to all think of yourself in this perspective. Figure out who makes you happy, and appreciate them because appreciation is one of the most simplest forms of showing how much you truly care about someone. Next up we have Junior Kathy Zhang, and she's going to be speaking about video games and gender imbalances in them. Okay, so let's start off by thinking of a female character in the game you recently played or watched. I'll give you a few seconds, and if you already have one in mind, then is she look like this? <coughs> um, look like this? Or is she look like this? And how to describe them? Sexy, suggestive, and and now let's keep this in mind and have a look at our male characters. Here are two male characters listed in this slide from Red Redemption and the other one I don't know. And how to describe them? They feel like powerful, violent, like warlike, and so you may figure out that there's a big difference between female and male characters in the video games. It usually shows over-exaggerated physical appearance, 
as women are usually more sexualized than men are. And they are treated as sex objects due to their lack of agency, lack of clothing, and the setting they inhabit. But why does that happen? Why does female characters often sexualize in video games? And why does video game industry even want to eliminate limiting the gender stereotypes at the first place? Well, here's my first point. Video game is initially target to male players. Now, don't do, like, argue with me that females also play games too, but let's have a look at the genre of video games first. Video game genres are usually action games, role play games, first person shooting, sports, adventure, and racing cars. By looking at those terms of genres, do you feel a sense of masculinity inside it? If you do, then there's my point. It doesn't mean the female group interest at the very first place. Now if I ask you guys a question, how many of you play games like those genres? I know like a lot of you guys are girls. I know a few of boys, so that's a big question here. Let's have a look at our, our statistics here. Well, good news. On the left hand side, there's equal representation of female and male who are playing PC games. But on the other hand, esports is still over dominated by men. As over 70% a male players compared to 20 to 30 percent of women. What does that mean? That means men are designing those games to men and they meet their group of interest. A typical example would be the League of Legends. The picture here on the left hand, the girl is called Mortana. She's a fallen angel. And by looking at her big balls and her bikini-like armor, do you feel a sense of female gender still times? And compared to the male character, also in this picture, if you can see it, is he like full muscle and power? Isn't that another gender stereotype too? Yeah, so that's a problem here. But why does that happen? Because people love this. People want to see those. Does this picture feel really appealing to you? Like, it's very appealing to me. I agree. It makes me feel excited and I want to play this game. That's also what video game industry wants. They make money from them. They attract people to play games, and they make profit. And that also leads to my second point, the issue within the video game industry. OK, now, so if the above statistic is not uh, shocking to you, then this one is. In the video game industry, the gender representation of developers is over dominated by men. There's 76% six, six of male developers compared to only 22% of female. That means men are designing those games compared to only a few female designing those games to meet a group of interest. So they designing those games, putting their stereotype into the game they design, and people are getting those information from the game. Like, imagine if you are HR and you are interviewed two person, one's a man and one's a woman, and from your very first impression, without considering anything else, like their ability, their experience, would you trust this guy more? Like, oh, this guy can make a good game. He knows what men want. He knows what people want. He can make fascinating games. But on the other hand, the woman, would you think that does she really have ex experience with those games? <coughs> can she really create a good game? If you do think so, then that's a problem. Women are not so encouraged to enter the job field, like STEM job, and the uh, technology and computer science do the big environment. Now, I'm not talking about top 10%. Like our school, we have all equal opportunity. We can access all information we want and go to any major in the future. But around the world, women are still not encouraged or even discriminated in this job of field. It's over dominated and discriminated. But why does it matter? Like, we all know video games just for pleasure. We play it for fun, we play it in the, our free time, and we don't see people wear bikini clothes and go to war, or we don't see people shooting around the street, or we don't even see people become killers, right? It's just video game, it's for fun. It's not reality, it's virtual world. We all know that, right? 
So why does it matter? Well, simply because the issue with video games is not the issue with video game. It's an issue with our society. Video game is just a reflection of what our society is undergoing. Our society is still undergoing the process of eliminating gender stereotypes, and that reflects in the video games. As there are still gen gender stereotypes going on, and people who hold those gender stereotypes put those information into their games, and people are absorbing those information from the game, and there's a cycle here. People give information to people, and from generation to generation. Well, there's absolutely improvements too, recently. Like, a typical example would be this picture, like you already saw this in the previous slide. It's an issue with over-sexualized posts from Overwatch that people complain about, then companies saw it and decided to delay this post from the game. Another typical uh, example would be the top popular game series, the Tomb Raider, if you know this game. The main character, Laura, she's a game character who's brave, who has all the same characteristics as other male characters in other adventure games. So that's a big improvement too. And talking about the most popular game recently, the Fortnite, it's good too. It has all kinds of characters, both men and women, both um, um, from all different cultures. So that's the thing here. We, our video game industry should recognize all kinds of gender and uh, cultural group of interest to create their games. And also, we need to encourage women to enter the job field to create those games, to meet the interest, and to help eliminate the gender stereotypes. Thank you. So Kathy is actually extending um, the subject of her TED Talk to her independent study project. So if you're interested in talking to her about it, I definitely encourage you to see her after the event and just ask her some questions. So to end the event, we have senior Faith Guggenhagen delivering a talk about dominating a, or sorry, dealing with a digitally dominated world. So with the show of hands, may you please raise your hand if you have a phone in front of you or on your person. Yes, that's what I expected. <laughs> so as you can see, this is a digital phone. And like you just told me, you all have phones right in front of you or in your hand. Now, y'all may be asking, what is she gonna ask me to do with my phone? Is she gonna use it? Is she gonna ask me to use it? Is she gonna ask me to put it away? Well, that's exactly what I'm gonna tell you to do. I'm gonna tell you to put your phones down. Now, you may be asking yourself, how did she come to this topic? How did she recognize that her world is digitally dominated? Well, my generation is often considered digital natives. We are the ones that grew up with technology abundant in our lives ever since we were little. This changed the way we saw things. And I came to this conclusion of talking about this discussion because I go out and I see families that are too busy, crouched over their mobile devices, not paying attention to each other or what's around them in the physical landscape. Rather, they are focused too hard on the digital landscape. Furthermore, I go out with friends and I see all of us not even really communicating with each other. We're too enveloped into our phones or too enveloped into getting the perfect Instagram photo or the perfect caption. We're not focusing on spending time together and relishing in the moments we have to share. So it's obvious that technology is all encompassing. It's obvious that we need it for everything we do. It facilitates many actions within our lives. There's been so many jobs created because of the influx of technology. Even in our school systems, we see it when textbooks are becoming electric, electrically downloaded as opposed to printed out, and we are turning in essays through computer systems as opposed to printed out physical copies. But how does technology serve detrimentally within our communicative skills? How do we, as a society, have become ingrained into relying on technology to communicate amongst ourselves? How have we allowed this to happen, and how have we not instead put the phone down and start communicating face to face? So my 
conclusion is that we have not been aware. We have not been aware of technology becoming an all-encompassing entity within our society. So an Elon University student decided to take a survey on people that reported whether or not they used their phones in the companies of loved ones or other family friends. She found that 62% of students reported that they did indeed use their cell phone while in the company of loved ones and family members. Now, for me, this is a scary statistic because she went to the extent of even seeing if the students realized or were aware that they were using this technology, and they reported that they weren't. So it's frightening to see how encompassing technology has become in our society. People aren't even aware that they're using it instead of taking advantage of all the time they have with loved ones and family members. Furthermore, Pew Research Center founded that on average, an adult will spend 5.9 hours on technology. This rounded up is six, and as we all know here, there's 24 hours in a day, meaning that you're spending a complete quarter of your day on technology or using social media. Now, how is this detrimental? Well, imagine all you could be doing while using this technology. You could get a job, you could be spending more time with friends, and as students, we all need sleep. We could literally be sleeping. So what is my conclusion? How do we fix this problem? How do we begin to realize that technology is by no means a necessity in our life, but rather a privilege that we have the luxury of experiencing? We must be aware, we must be cognizant that technology is all-encompassing, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. So I challenge you to hang up and to hang out and to start taking every single moment that you have in front of someone to face-to-face -face communicate in all advantage. Thank you. That concludes our third annual TED event. Can I please get one more round of applause?